How does a man go from being the author of the strictest laws against black people in a free state to someone who, 31 years later, is being praised by statesman and activist Frederick Douglass as someone he trusts when it comes to the needs of black Americans? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. This spotlight is on John A. Logan, lawyer, politician, general, statesman, and the man who is responsible for making Memorial Day a yearly occurrence in the United States. This is the Civil War Project. Let's talk history. John A. Logan was born in 1826 in what is now Murfreesboro, Illinois, located in Southern Illinois. But let's put that on hold just a minute because I think we need to discuss his father, Dr. John Logan, as well as slavery within the state of Illinois because this is how Logan's earlier beliefs are developed. His father was a doctor and a Jacksonian Democrat who was born in Ireland but had immigrated to the United States when he was five. Dr. Logan had made a fortune in Missouri and came to Illinois in 1823 and established a farm. He would eventually be the founder of Murfreesboro 20 years later. When Dr. Logan had moved to Illinois, he had two enslaved persons, a mother and her one-year-old son. Though Illinois was admitted to the Union as a free state in 1818, meaning slavery was not legal, it wasn't so clear-cut. Slavery was an institution that had thrived since the 1700s when the French were in Illinois, and many were not eager to eliminate that institution. People worked to have Illinois admitted as a slave state, but at the time the federal government was walking a thin line regarding slavery, and to accomplish that they were keeping an equal balance of free and slave states, which meant Illinois had to be free. However, there were laws made around this within the state. Existing slaves, especially those who worked in the salt mines, were grandfathered in and could be kept as slaves for the rest of their lives. In the case of Dr. Logan, his two enslaved people became indentured servants, where contracts could be for up to 99 years. Southern Illinois was originally the most populated part of the state in its early years due to its many rivers and streams and its abundance of trees that were needed to build homes, furniture, tools, etc. Eventually, people realized that the land in central and northern Illinois was quite fertile, so eventually there was this shift over the decades of population from the south to the north. Most of the northern part of the population came from free states. The southern part of Illinois would eventually be referred to as Little Egypt because people equated Egypt with slavery due to the Bible. And according to the Boston Liberator in 1853, many saw Illinois Egyptians as mostly poor white people originally from the southern states who were too poor to own slaves themselves and too ignorant to know any better than to indulge the prejudices and support the conduct of those who did. So this is the world that John Logan was born and raised in. Logan would be described as an energetic kid with black hair and eyes. John learned to play the fiddle and was an excellent jockey. He was also interested in politics and wanted to become a politician from a very young age. He studied with his father and a private tutor for many years and attended Shiloh College in Southern Illinois for three years. His father treated him like an adult from a very early age, even having 10-year-old John manage the family farm while he was away serving as an Illinois state representative. Fun fact, Dr. Logan became close friends with Abraham Lincoln during his time in the assembly, so much so that Lincoln suggested that the now named Logan County be named in Dr. Logan's honor. Ironically, today the town of Lincoln serves as the county seat, so the two names are forever entwined. In 1847, when John was 21, he volunteered to fight in the Mexican War. By the time he got to Santa Fe, New Mexico, he almost dies from the measles. His captain, John Cunningham, entertained John by reading letters from his 10-year-old daughter, Mary. John was so impressed by the letters that he jokingly vowed to marry her when she was old enough. John would serve as the second lieutenant and his regimental quartermaster during the Mexican War. When John got back to Illinois, he would study law and he won his first election as Jackson County clerk. 
He graduated from the University of Louisville in 1851 with a law degree and was first elected to the Illinois House of Representatives as a Democrat in 1852. It was during this time that Logan became famous for something he would later regret, the Black Codes. Logan never tried to hide his views on slavery, and many in Southern Illinois in particular felt the same way he did. When making a speech against a law that would allow black people to testify in court, Logan would state, it was never intended that whites and blacks should stand in equal relation. By 1848, slavery and indentured servitude was no longer legal in Illinois. However, by 1853, John Logan sponsored what would be called the Black Codes, which was largely in response to the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act approved by the U.S. Congress, requiring enslaved persons to be returned to their owners if found in a free state. These newly proposed Illinois laws from Logan stated that if any African American entered Illinois and stayed beyond 10 days, they would face a misdemeanor and large fines. If the fines could not be paid, the county sheriff could sell the individual's labor until they were paid in full, but thereby turning the individual into a slave. If a fine was imposed, whoever turned in the African American was entitled to half of it. The Black Codes passed two to one. These new black laws were considered the harshest of any northern state and would remain in place until the end of the Civil War in 1865. In June 1855, Logan visited his old captain and his daughter Mary, who was now 17. He fell in love with Mary, and after several months of courtship and exchanging letters, Mary chose to marry him by October that same year, and they settled in Benton, Illinois. Their son John died before his first birthday, but they would also have a daughter, Elizabeth, and a second son, Manning, after the Civil War. In 1858, Logan was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives by winning 80% of the vote in Illinois' southernmost district, the 9th District, and he easily won again in 1860. He was a staunch supporter of fellow Democrat, Illinoisan, and U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas, as well as the Fugitive Slave Act. He was nicknamed Dirty Work by his Republican opponents, due to a speech he gave stating that Democrats in Illinois were alone in enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. It was dirty work, but he didn't mind it because laws and the Constitution needed to be enforced. And in this case, it was the Fugitive Slave Act that needed to be enforced. Logan was dismayed when Abraham Lincoln won the 1860 presidential election but he was even more concerned that the people he represented in Southern Illinois were in support of secession. He wrote a friend that those who dream that this Confederacy can separate peacefully will wake up to the conviction of their sad error, I fear, too late. He was frustrated with the extremes of both parties, but he would state in early 1861 that the election of Mr. Lincoln, deplorable as it may be, affords no justification or excuse for overthrowing the Republic. We cannot stand silently by while the joint action of extremists are dragging us to ruin. After Lincoln became president and the congressional term was completed, Logan went back home to Little Egypt. A secessionist meeting was held after Fort Sumter to determine support for Little Egypt seceding from Illinois and the Union and becoming part of the Confederacy. After all, only one in five votes in Southern Illinois had voted for Lincoln. Logan didn't attend the meeting and nothing ended up happening, but for those early months in the war, Logan was conflicted between his beliefs on slavery, his family's staunch support for the South, the support of his constituents for the South, and his other strongly held belief that what the Confederacy was doing was treason. He was really upset when his idol, Stephen Douglas, became pro-Union and pro-war, throwing aside any notion of peace or compromise. By June 1861, Southern Illinois was flooded with refugees fleeing the southern states that had seceded, 
as well as Union troops that were now gathering in Cairo, Illinois. By mid-June, Stephen Douglas had died. Some say from typhoid, others say from heavy drinking and complete exhaustion from traveling around the North and South, first trying to prevent war, but then trying to get people to enlist in the Union. Logan finally decides that he will support the Union cause. He had always followed along behind Douglas, so perhaps that's why he made this particular choice. After all, on May 1st, Stephen Douglas had said that there can be no neutrals in this war, only patriots or traitors. Logan chose patriot. Logan goes to Springfield, where he meets Colonel Ulysses S. Grant, who expressed concern that his three-month enlistments would leave and not renew for the three years that the government was now requesting. Logan offered to talk to Grant's men, and Grant agreed, even though he was somewhat concerned about what this pro-slavery politician might say. Grant would write that, Logan's speech inspired my men to such a point that they would have volunteered to remain in the army until the nation's enemies were totally defeated. By mid-July 1861, Logan was back in Washington and now visiting Union troops in Virginia, while in a long dress coat and top hat. He ended up joining the 2nd Michigan Volunteers. He marched with them to battle, musket in hand, and fought for four hours in the first Battle of Bull Run, probably being the best-dressed man in the field. He made the decision several days later to join the fight. In August 1861, he stood in Marion, Illinois, and said, I, for one, shall stand or fall for this union. And I just want to say, it was actually a very big deal for Logan to choose the Union, because his entire family and his wife's family were very pro-Confederacy. Several of them would go down to the South and fight. Even one of his own sisters told him that she hoped he would be killed before he even reached Cairo. Okay, back to the story. He immediately began to raise troops that would form the Illinois 31st Volunteer Infantry Regiment. His troops would call him Black Jack due to his black eyes and hair. Logan gave up his congressional seat as he became a military leader for the Union, eventually becoming Major General, serving under Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman, and participating in battles at Belmont, Fort Donaldson, where he was shot in the shoulder and thigh, Corinth, Vicksburg, Atlanta, Jonesboro, and Bentonville, just to name a few. Logan became known as the hero of the Battle of Atlanta when General James B. McPherson was shot and killed, and Logan had to then assume his command of the Army of the Tennessee. He even helped stump for President Lincoln in Illinois during the 1864 election, at Lincoln's request. The landscape changed for Logan in 1863 when black soldiers were allowed to enlist in the fight against the Confederacy something he actually encouraged his Union troops to support. For a man who had very little interaction with Black people before that time, where he was very limited to just dealing with them when they were slaves or indentured servants, he was now watching their bravery and determination and fighting for their freedom, and was slowly beginning to see that his long-held beliefs were wrong. Logan would run for political office again after the war, but this time as a radical Republican. This new type of Republican was someone who vigorously opposed slavery during the war. They demanded harsh treatment of former Confederates and passed the three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, which abolished slavery, gave citizenship to all people born in the United States, and gave Black American men the right to vote. He also supported women's suffrage, though that is not something he would live to see. This is where it gets a little interesting, though, so bear with me. In 1865, Logan gave a speech in Louisville, Kentucky, in favor of the 13th Amendment that would abolish slavery. Blaming the war on slavery, Logan asked how any mortal man could desire to see such a cause of sorrow and suffering, injury and infamy, hypocrisy and hate, perpetuated in the United States, imploring them to strike at once and deal slavery a death blow that liberty might be proclaimed to the end of the earth. However, he also promised that they would not be giving black people the right to enjoy the privilege of voting or holding office. 
So it's a year later, and Logan gives a speech in Salem, Illinois, in defense of the 14th Amendment, which stated that anyone born in the United States was considered a citizen. Logan stated that, like his audience, he had his prejudices, but the bravery of black people during the Civil War had changed them. The 14th Amendment would give them the protection of the law. However, as he said in his Louisville speech the year before, he once again says that this will not give black people the right to enjoy the privilege of voting or holding office. So, in 1868, he's now in Ohio, and he is to give a speech to promote the state's constitutional amendment to allow black men to vote and hold office. The U.S. constitutional amendment on this, the 15th, had not yet been passed. We were still two years away from that. During the Ohio speech, he states, I don't care whether a man is black, red, blue, or white. He has the right to choose the men who control the government. So one could say that maybe it took him a little time to get on board with each one of the amendments. Or you could also potentially say that maybe he knew that it was easier to sell something starting small and then gradually going larger, which is why you have the space of time between the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and when they were passed. And you have to wonder if part of that was just getting people on board with the first part, knowing that then you come back and get them on board for the second, and you come back and get them on board for the third. When Logan ran for vice president of the Republican ticket in 1884 with James Blaine running as president, Frederick Douglass, one of the most influential Americans in the 19th century, gave a speech endorsing Logan, showing just how far he had come in his personal journey when it came to people of color. Douglas would say, if there is any statesman on this continent, now in public life, to whose courage, justice, and fidelity, I would more fully and unreservedly trust the cause of the colored people of this country, or the cause of any other people, I do not know him. Since Charles Sumner and O.P. Morton, no man has been bolder or truer to the cause of the colored man and to the country than has John A. Logan. There is no nonsense about him. I endorse him to you with all my might, mind, and strength, and without a single shadow of doubt. The Blaine-Logan ticket would lose to Democrat Grover Cleveland. In December 1886, Logan was a Republican U.S. Senator from Illinois. At his home in Washington, his arms had swelled and his lower limbs were in extreme pain. He had a few good days, but then the pain came back and he was in and out of consciousness. By Christmas Eve, the doctors feared it was fatal, and on December 26, 1886, John Logan passed away at the age of 60. There are some that would say that the reason he died fairly young was due to those injuries that he had sustained at Fort Donelson. He lay in state at the U.S. Capitol, and his tomb is at the United States Soldiers and Airmen's Home National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. So, when it comes to Memorial Day, what role did Logan play? He's often credited as the founder, but it's not that straightforward. In 1866, the Grand Army of the Republic was created by Dr. Benjamin Stevenson in Decatur, Illinois. This fraternal organization included men from the Army, Navy, and Marines who had fought for the United States during the Civil War. In 1868, when Logan was serving as its commander-in-chief, he issued General Order No. 11, declaring May 30th as Decoration Day and for it to be an annual occurrence. The day would be spent honoring those Union soldiers who had died in the war by decorating their graves in flowers. The idea itself was not originally his, however. It had some previous variations. In October 1864, there was a Memorial Day that occurred in Bowlesburg, Pennsylvania, where three women decorated the graves of fallen soldiers. In May 1865, there was another Memorial Day held in Charleston, South Carolina, where black freedmen and white abolitionist allies hosted a huge historically significant program where 257 Union dead were buried. In March 1866, Secretary Mary Ann Williams from the Southern-based Ladies Memorial Association had a letter published in the local Columbus, Georgia newspaper 
She advocated for a day to be set aside and to be handed down through time as a religious custom of the country, to wreathe the graves of our martyred dead with flowers. The date chosen was April 26th. The city cemetery was in a bit of disarray. It had both Union and Confederate graves, so soldiers from both sides were honored. Columbus, Mississippi would hold a very similar service the day before, therefore claiming to be the first city to hold the event, beating Columbus, Georgia by a single day. John Logan was aware of these ceremonies, but it's his wife Mary who approached him to really consider such an idea. She had visited cemeteries in and outside of Richmond, Virginia in March 1868 and was surprised to see the grave sites all decorated with Confederate flags, flowers, wreaths, and ribbons. She was very moved by what she saw, and when she reunited with her husband, she shared the idea, thinking something similar should be done for Union soldiers. He picked May 30th, with his wife later writing that he chose that day as he felt flowers would be at their greatest perfection. The Grand Army of the Republic would credit an anonymous comrade who had written one of its higher members and recounted how in Germany it was customary to visit cemeteries and strew flowers on the graves. This served as the foundation of the Decoration Day order. John Logan would add several paragraphs before sending the order out. So on May 30th, 1868, at Arlington National Cemetery, John Logan gave a speech and stated that, Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. Let us, in the solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges upon the nation's gratitude the soldier's and sailor's widow and orphan. It was described as a beautiful day, sunny and warm, absolutely perfect. By 1890, every state in the Union had adopted Decoration Day as a yearly occurrence on May 30th. The term Memorial Day started being used in 1882, but it wasn't until 1971 that Congress made the Memorial Day name official and made it a federal holiday to be celebrated on the last Monday of the month in May. That is what we continue to celebrate today for all United States soldiers who died serving our country in all wars. Southern states still hold Confederate Memorial Days, though their dates of celebration differ state by state. So if you don't quite know how to feel about John Logan, I understand. On the one side, he's the man who sponsored the Illinois Black Codes, but then we have the man Frederick Douglass described at Logan's death, calling Logan a brave man who spread around the Negro the network of the law. I really appreciate you letting me discuss his complex history and views, as I feel there's a lot to be learned from someone who was once in the wrong, but realized it and did something about it. Logan not only changed his mind about black people, but he also worked hard to change the minds of people that he knew felt like he once did. And this is the man we have to thank for making Memorial Day a yearly event where we honor the dead, men and women from all backgrounds, who died in the service to this country, for which we owe them a debt of gratitude that can never fully be repaid. If you enjoyed this video and since I'm a new channel, I would appreciate it if you like, subscribe, share, all that fun stuff that all YouTubers ask for. And as always, I bid you an affectionate farewell.